This week on Intrigued, Full of Fact. Just get out there, fight, be your be your missing loved one's voice. Because um, a parent told me before, if you don't do it, they won't do it. I'm Shandrea Thomas, and welcome to episode 23. In this podcast, I talk about curious cases, disappearances, and other stuff. And today, it's my first podcast of 2020, and I'm also marking the one-year anniversary of doing this podcast. Today, I'm talking about the disappearance of 16-year-old Dominique Holly Grisham from Rochester, New York. It's a strange case of a young man who got a phone call from a friend, walked out the front door, and vanished without a trace. All of this happening on the same day the family was planning a belated birthday party and the celebration of a hockey game he had won earlier that day. I spoke to his mother, Moselle, and reached out to Rochester police about the case. Hear what Moselle had to say about her life now and her more than 10-year search for her son. Today is Dominique's birthday. This is what happened. All right, uh, Moselle Grisham, thank you for joining me to talk about your son, Dominique. Um, so let's just, for people who may not be familiar with your son's case, tell me what happened. When did he go missing? What happened on that day? Um, on February 12, 2009, Dominique had a hockey game, and um, they played hockey for the local Carter Street Rec Center. Um, he had just turned 16 in January, so we were going to plan a um, party. Um, I left. I was gone. Dominique was home with my best friend and my younger son, Antonio. And, you know, my best friend, Jeremy, said, Dominique, you know, regular 16-year-old boy, cleaned up, was making a couple of CDs to play at the party. Somebody called him on the cell phone. He walked out the door, and that was the last time we seen her from him. Did he say who called him? Did he say why he was leaving? Nothing like that? No. He just was talking on his phone, and Jeremy, just, you know, a regular 16-year-old boy just was on his phone, went downstairs to talk. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, just out of curiosity, what time of day was this on this particular day? Um, It was during the day, so I want to say, like, around maybe noonish, 1 o'clock. At what point did you guys realize that something was really wrong? When he never returned home and time was going and then that evening I called the police and they were like, you know, we had to wait in a certain amount of hours before we could do a report or anything. And time just kept coming and going and we didn't hear or see Dominique. So then I knew something was wrong. What happened when you went to police to report him missing? They told me because he was a 16 year old boy, you know, did he run away? Maybe he just left for the night, and I'm like, that's not left. Dominique is my second oldest out of six boys. It's not like for him to just leave, nor we were planning a party, and not get in touch with his father or my other boys, because they were all close. Mm-hmm. So, so, so anybody, go ahead. When he didn't contact anybody or nobody has heard from him, that's when we began to worry, and we knew something was wrong. Okay, so so you had to wait until like one or two days after, he, like at least 24 hours from missing or 48 hours? Yes. It was 24, yes. hours, 24 hours. Okay, so during that 24 hours, what did you guys do? Did you guys go to friends? How did you try to find him? Just sat at home, worried, praying, crying. His older brother tried to reach out to friends. We just couldn't think, you know, riding around, looking in the neighborhood. Riding around to my sister houses, you know, just calling any and everybody that we could call. And then um, at what point did he, did they actually, I guess did the police actually start searching for him? Did you guys ever conduct searches for him or? Yes. Later on that evening, the police came by, they did a police report. You know, I gave him his uh, last known girlfriend at the time, which was Desiree. They went to her house to see if he was over there. He wasn't there. And then that's, that's where they left it at said that they would keep the case open. And then three years went by. I didn't know what to do, where to go. Just taking it one day at a time, wishing my baby would walk through the door or we would get a phone call or something saying he's okay or somebody seen him or somebody spotted him. But it took three years for them to really take my baby case seriously. Wow. So we'll get to that in just a second. Um, So the whole idea, and I think a lot of parents, unfortunately, and the reality is some kids do run away. We know that, right? 
But there's also those kids, not all of them are runaways. We know that too. So so how did you feel about the whole idea of like your son possibly running away? I mean, he's never done that before, right? And he have ever had any mind to do that? Nope, never had that. And when he said he ran away, I'm like, he didn't take any clothes, no shoes. He didn't take nothing. He just walked down the stairs on his cell phone. He wouldn't have the reason to run away. Never did it before. Dad is very, very active in their lives. So that issue, that was never a point to me saying that he ran away. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about the girlfriend? What did she say? The last communication she had with him? or? Well, she spoke with him, you know, before the party, because when I left, they were on the computer together. And when we went over there, she just was like, no, I haven't seen him. I don't know. It was just really weird, but she said she hadn't seen him. But she stayed in contact with me, and, you know, she sent her prayers and her love. And, you know, the police searched her house, and he was there was no sign of him there. But, you know, I just, me, I just felt more could have been, could have, you know, been done with, with what I know now. I just feel a lot more could have been done in my son's case. Yeah, and, and and that's what I want to get to now. So you're talking about like three years later is when you feel like police started to take this case seriously. So as far as like the pinging of his phone, because there's, there's all these questions. Who was the last person he called? Where was his phone pinged last? You know, right. on social media, on all one, those things. Tell, tell me one, about that. Yep, I lived on the one-way street, which and the camera could have showed which way he walked. When I knew... The camera that was on the corner store that they had faced my house. You could see my house from the camera. You know, I could have noticed if a, if a car picked them up because it was a one-way street. So the car would have had to go past my house. You know, which way did he walk? Which way did he go? Anything, you know, like you said, who was the last person he called? It could have pinged the towers. You know, we could have got out there and searched. It, it's just so much go through my mind at what they should have, could have, would have did. You know, they did pull up his um, MySpace account at the time. It was no activity or nothing showing on his MySpace. Just a typical 16-year-old boy. And um, I didn't know anything about Facebook. That's when I originally started my Facebook when Dominique went missing in 2009. Wow. So so within this, within this three-year time frame, what did the police do from the day that you reported your son up to this three-year point. So what happened at that time? Nothing. Just kept, I was calling, nothing. To this day, I have yet to hear from my investigator. We had a possible sighting. Me and my family did more than investigating. My son drove up there, you know, because I have, you know, made a stat. And the guy thought maybe he's seen Dominique or someone that looked like Dominique. Called my investigator. To this day, he has not called me back. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So what do you think you would do differently now at this point, um, knowing knowing what you know now? I mean, wow, 10 years down the line, 11 years down the line, what do you think you could do differently? Because unfortunately, another parent will be in your shoes. I hate to say that, but it's a reality. What would you say to someone to help them? You know, I know this is kind of rough for you. Oh, no, it's good. So like, reach out. You know, if you ever know, because a lot of people could say, oh, it never happened to me, but you never know. I never knew that was going to be the last time I see my son. You know, just know their friends, know where they go, be more on them. You know, if the police don't want to help, you know, family and friends, make flyers, hang them up, get on social media. The social media goes a long way, and they will share flyers on social media quicker than the police would. Um, I do want to, you know, say, when the Poly Class Foundation found out about Dominique's disappearance, they did provide me with flyers every time that I called to say that I was going to do a walk or I was going to do a, a search. They made sure I had at least 500 flyers. So, you know, I appreciate them for that. You know, um, other than that, just get out there, fight, be your, be your missing loved one's voice. Because um, a parent told me before, if you don't do it, they won't do it. So that's why I tried my hardest on his anniversary, on his birthday. I just had a billboard put up. I tried to just keep his name and his face in the memory. Until mm-hmm. one day, you know, that he will come home or 
at least we know where he, you know, find out where he is. Were you able to ever get any type of media coverage for his disappearance or anything like that? Years later down the line, when I started doing like stuff for his anniversary, um, Channel 10, you know, Channel 8 in Rochester would come out. When I just did the billboard, you know, the media met me out there where they hung his billboard up at. And, you know, then I had an event at my church and they showed up there and, you know, they aired it. So they they kind of keep in touch with me around his birthday and his anniversary. As far as um, when it comes to if your son was involved with anything, any type of activity that would have put him in danger, you don't have any indication of anything like that? No, I just feel really helping out somebody or, you know, he wouldn't have put himself in no predicament unless he was helping a friend. Because as to my knowledge, I don't believe he was in the streets doing nothing. They played sports. But now I'm going to football, basketball, hockey was a hockey player. They love their sports. And for him not to reach out to nobody in my family or his brothers, I feel something has, has you know, happened to him. And I don't want to feel that way, but a part of me knows that he's not here. And I you know, I have dreams of seeing him to where he would be so close that I could reach out and grab him. And I feel, you know, it's going to come to me on what happened to my baby. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to claim that I'm going to get the closure that I'm looking for. So when it comes to his particular circle of friends, not the mystery one that you don't know who calls, because at this point you don't know who that is. But did he have a, a circle of friends that you went to, or did you did he just hang with his brothers? It's mostly with his brothers and cousins. I mean, we have a big family. But when he did go to school in Honeyway Falls, we did go out there and do a walk and search out there and hunt flyers because he lived out there with his godparents for a while. Um, so we hung flyers out there and we did a walk and I did a, you know an event out there. But mainly, mainly in Rochester, mainly cousins. I mean, we, I have a big, really big family. So if for no one not to know anything or, you know, then a part of me thinks somebody knows, you know, got a feeling somebody knows something and just not saying it. You know, I, I get a lot of mixed emotional feelings about the situation. Here's a question. Around that time frame, just out of curiosity, do you remember any crime happening around that time? Any shootings, any, you know, any particular type of things that were occurring at the time when your son disappeared? Like, was there a shooting in the neighborhood at that time? Was there other people who disappeared at that time or anything like that? I know um, when Dominique went missing in February 2009, Brittany Drexel went missing in April 2009. And, you know, and that's when, you know, I knew another, the, the families that I have that I'm involved with with missing and missing. I know a couple of them, them family had loved ones missing before Dominique, and then it was some missing after Dominique. Mm -hmm. And they don't believe any of those case instances are connected or anything like that? No. It sounds to me just in listening to you and like listening and hearing all, a lot of other parents talk about, you know, as they go through this process of, of um, dealing, you know, and coping with a missing loved one, the thing that stands out to me is that in the beginning of everything, it seems like it could have been so different had you had the sources to be able to search for your son and knew the questions to ask and know what resources to go to. Talk about the importance of that, because I, I think that's really key for, unfortunately, people who may be in your shoes in the future and how they can get ahead of, uh, steps ahead of the process. And like I said, is, you know, touching on that, you know, when you get a loved one that go missing, get on social media, get a flyer, get the last known picture that you have share it, get as much information as you can on the person and just continue to share it. And, you know, because I feel if we'd have had, if I'd have knew then what I knew now, I probably would have been a step closer to finding my son. Because as after joining the group Missing the Missing and we would get a case, we would get a flyer done, we would get out there, we would do the searches. We would, you know, keep that person face in the media. People were watching. You'd be surprised you know, how fast a, a missing person flyer can it can share on Facebook. And you never know who know who and when, why, or who can see who. So as anybody now that goes through having a missing loved one, my thing is get the latest picture that you have, get as much information and share. Get your loved one face in the community, in the news, in the media, and share it.
Be there. Be your missing loved one's voice. And it's this, the, the unfortunate part, the, the horrible part about all of this is that three-year time pe period that you are waiting for answers, waiting for information, all of the information that could have led to him is gone. Right. Right. You know? Uh, so tell me about the the impact on you. I know you said you've moved away from Rochester. Tell me the tell me about the impact on you his disappearance has had not only on you but on your family as well. What's happened? Well, each one of my boys go through you know their phase. You know, like around his birthday and his anniversary. You know, my my one of my younger sons wrote a stat. You know, his biggest fear in life is finding out his missing brother is deceased. You know, then I went into a depression because I just felt somebody close to me knew something and just wasn't saying anything, or I just felt somebody knew something and being so secretive, it just like took me to a, a whole nother level and I, it was eating me up. So I had to get away. Not saying that I, you know, run a, ran away from it, but I had to take care of myself because nobody's going to look for Dominique harder than me. So, you know, I had to get myself right so that I can continue to look for my son. Hmm. And since then you've been become a part of an organization, what, what's the name of it again? Missing the Missing. Okay, tell me about that group and what do you guys do? Um, well, I was, it was in Rochester. Nicole Coleman started it um, when her nephew Alonzo Williams went missing. Unfortunately, he was found, you know, deceased. But, you know, we used to just meet to get together and meet on Mondays and, you know, mm -hmm. think of ways to get, give back to the community to help, you know, people, ask, you know, give them ideas on what to do when their loved one go missing. We would just do something, you know, around, like, say, Dominique's birthday or Ryan's anniversary, around a missing loved one anniversary. It was just the organization where we all knew we could come together and had that time and know what we were there for because we all were in the same situation. We had a missing loved one. Mm -hmm. And you guys have actually had, I've seen a couple of age progression uh, pictures of your son. Um, when was the last one done? Are you guys planning to do one pretty anytime soon? I'm hoping to contact the Center for Missing and Exploited Children for his, he'll be 20, 26 on the 15th of January. So I'm hoping they can get me one done for that. Because I think the last one he had done was 23. Mm -hmm. uh, what about DNA? Have you guys submitted your DNA and all that kind of stuff just in case? Yes, my DNA is on file, his father, and I think four out of his six brothers. The girlfriend, you said you still have a relationship with her. Did you remember yes. what she said her last contact was with him or what they talked about? Just the day of the party. That was the last time she spoke or heard from him. Did she say what they talked about? No, nope, she was coming over to go to the party. But let my investigator tell her they were at a Rocky or they were arguing. I didn't know anything about that until I heard it in his interview. But, you know, after he went missing, you know, she would call me on his birthday. She would reach out to me on his anniversary, you know. She would write her little stat about him, so... You know, we have a lot of people that care and miss miss him a lot. Mm -hmm. Do you remember your last conversation with your son and what that was? Uh, he, he tone tone called me and told me he took the remote from him. So he was like, um, you better come get him before I beat him up. But they're a typical <laughs> boy. And I'm like, Dominique, just leave my baby alone. We are on our way back home. So if there was anything that if, – if he were to somehow see this or someone – who knows where he is, where to see this. If you were able to say something to your son, what would you say to him? That yeah, we love him. We miss him. We want him home. Not a day go by that we don't think about you, Dominique. It's been too many Christmases, holidays, birthdays, not being here. Not without you being here. I would never give up looking. I would never give up searching. This is a journey and a commitment that I have that I'm going to figure out and I'm going to find out what happened to you on February 12, 2009. All right. And what would you say to folks who might have information about what may have happened with him? 
please, you can call it in anonymously. No, nothing is too small. No evidence is too small. I don't want people to feel, well, oh, I didn't know what to say. Or I didn't know how to do it. Please, if anybody know anything, nothing, like I said, nothing is too small. Please call the local 911 in Rochester, the police department. Reach out, social media. I just want closure. We just want our baby home. Dominique has a lot of family that he hasn't met, new cousins, new nieces, new nephews, and it's not fair. We need this part of our chapter. We want the closure. It's going to be, it's about to be 11 years. Is there anything else that you want? Tell me about your son. Um, what was he like? What did he like to do? You said he played a lot of sports and things like that. Tell me about his personality and all of that. Um, Dominique was my second oldest, like I said. You know, they play, he's played football, basketball, soccer, hockey. Uh, very outgoing, could be shy sometimes, loved his brothers, hung out with his brothers, their dad, like I said, their dad was very active, very active in their life, um, liked to go to church, he went to East High School, and just a typical kid. Did he ever say what he wanted to be when he grew up? Football player. His things, what do you have any of his, his possessions now still, or is there anything that you really hold on to? Yeah, it has clothes. Um, we have like sh a shirt or two. I have pictures. Um, as you see the billboard behind me, I have a lot of pictures. I did a lot of moving, I had uh, a house fire, so a lot of their baby pictures I lost, a lot of possessions I lost. Mm. But I have faith and hope that that's what's in my heart. Yeah, I'm going to have the closure sooner than later. All right. Um, is there anything else that, that I didn't ask you about that you want to say? No, just I want my baby home. And anybody that know anything, please tell us. Okay. Stop, call. When it comes to my final thoughts about this case, I have to wonder exactly who called Dominique that day and why. And who was this mystery person? And are they still alive? Did Dominique see something he wasn't supposed to see that day? His mom said he was supposedly helping a friend, but the question is, why did this unknown person need his help? It would seem to me that someone knows something and just won't speak up. Another unfortunate reality is that the family couldn't get any access to Dominique's cell phone information or video cameras in the neighborhood because they didn't have the right information or direction on how to get access. I also emailed and called the Rochester Police Department multiple times to get an update on this case. As of this podcast, there was no response. But if you do have any information in this case, call the Rochester Police Department at 585 Four two eight six five nine five. Dominique would be turning 26 years old today. If you have a case that you want me to check out, just message me on the Intrigued Full Effect website or via email at intriguedfulleffect at hotmail.com. Until next time, be safe and stay true. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the Intrigued Full Effect, Curious Cases, Disappearances, and Other Stuff podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the host. The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. The host of this podcast assumes no liability or responsibility for any activities in connection with opinions shared in the podcast. The podcast and blog associated with it shall not be used in any legal capacity or as a basis for expert testimony. Any copyright material in the podcast is approved by the owner or as part of the public domain. Music by Pond5.